It's Wizards vs. Lesbians, a podcast for your ears. Hello and welcome to Wizards vs. Lesbians. My name is Isaac. I'm Alexis. And today we are discussing All Good Children by Dana Ingram. Would you like to do the plot? Sure. So about 25 years ago, some sort of horrible immortal vulture demons invaded the Earth um, and quickly conquered it, leaving Australia a nuclear blasted hellscape. Um, and now they round up children who are insufficiently something uh, and put them in a special summer camp. And uh, angsty, queer, oppositional, defiant, disordered teen uh, girl Jordan has mm-hmm. is pretty sure that she is going to go get sent to the summer camp where most kids do not return from. Um, and on the, uh, but on the dubiously plus side, the collabor- human collaborator liaison who's evaluating her is really hot. I, that's a perfect summation. Um, <laughs> and, the, and then things continue to get weirder from that point on. Yes. Um, uh, are there, uh, lesbians in this book? Oh yeah. Yes. Um, are there wizards? Well, there's... Giant, unkillable, telepathic vulture demons. Yep, they they will do. They're um, they're pretty wizard like, you know. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think they they serve the the standard wizard function very well. <laughs> no real need to stretch it. Um, and uh, yes, they are very much in conflict. Um, Jordan is in conflict with absolutely everybody. Yes. Why should you read this book? It's weirdly compelling. Like, I've read this, I stumbled on this thing years ago when I was hopping through the incredibly awful recommendation, uh, overdrive recommendation system uh, that the Seattle Public Library had. And I read it while I was, you know, just because I needed something to fill the time when I wasn't working on grad school. And it has stayed with me for quite a while until, but I couldn't remember what it was called. So it took me a long time to track it down for this podcast. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you did, because I also really enjoyed this book. Um, I think that uh, in our last Q&A episode, which uh, went up the day that we were recording this, um, you talked about books that miss the point of The Hunger Games. Uh, yes. This one emphatically does not miss the point of this The Hunger Games. This one really does not miss the point of The Hunger Games. This yes, one is very uh, much, you know, about the ways that we use up our children. Um, it, it really, really <laughs> is. Uh It's like, it's one of those books where you can close one eye and you're like, oh my God, this is a mess. And you can close the other eye and you're like, oh wow, this is actually like remarkably good in a lot of very surprising ways. Um, And I think that uh, a way in which it excels its peers is in its character writing. Um, Yeah. It's like, it's, it tries some very difficult things and pulls them all off uh, with multiple narrator voices, uh, very distinct motivations of characters who you sympathize with but who are in conflict with each other uh really really great in in terms of like character and motivation yeah Um, and it has some good tragic moments where because like i feel like a good tragedy part of what sells it is the character is you know you have to believe that the character really would make these decisions that are going to put them on this tragic path and that these are reasonable decisions for a person to make in their situation um mm -hmm. Or if they're not reasonable, they're understandable, right? Because otherwise it's just people being stupid and that's less of a tragedy and more just life. But, mm-hmm. um, and I feel like this one, because she's able to sell you on the characters and their motivations and the ways in which they are in just such terrible circumstances, it, it makes the various tragic arcs work better. Yes. Um, and in addition to that, it does something that we r- really remarkably haven't seen much of um, I think outside of Baru Cormorant, um, which I think is is something that we could compare to this book, uh, which is that it really is unsparing about the personal and social cost of revolution. Like it 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 really rolls out that even under the most intolerable tyranny, like there are a lot of really good reasons why somebody might choose not to buck it. You know? Yeah. Um, and no, it, you're and right. You're right. Both of it, these books are really interested in why would somebody be a collaborator. Exactly. And I think this book really gets into that, like just by just simply by showing the the, the price of 
of disobedience, you know, <laughs> and right. like the price of resistance, you, it, it, it chews up your life, you know, and you know, that might be worth it and it might not be, you know? Yeah. Um, as to as to why you shouldn't read it. Oh, I have um, to. And one more reason why oh, you sorry, should. Yeah. One more reason why you should read it is that it is shorter than most books and weird. And I think this podcast is a big fan of books that are on the shorter side and willing to be really weird. Um, so. Yeah, this felt like one of our blurbos. Um, right. <laughs> if 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 one can say that without being condescending, but this is one of our <laughs> weird little guys. Yes, um, <laughs> and like we love our weird little guys. We do. Uh. As far as um, as far as not uh, as far as why you shouldn't read it, um, I mean, it is again one of those like weird, messy books, and as such, there are some things that don't work. Um, yeah, um, it is like it's a it is a successful tragedy, which means it's a bit of a downer. <laughs> yes, the, it is certainly that. There's a lot of like, I think there is a lot of, and this is very realistic. There's a lot of like weird sexuality pinging around um yeah if, if your character is a ninth grader um if one of your point of view characters is a ninth grader that's going to, be, to happen if you're going to be like doing it realistically mm -hmm. um and i think that it really does that but it also just sort of like there it's this is like uh, this is again i mean another thing to compare this to is uh girls of paper and fire um because there's sort of the same like Oh my God! When is the when are we're going off to rape camp? You know when is the rape going to happen? Yeah. Um, and uh, although it doesn't happen on screen in this one as it does in uh, Paper and Fire, there is uh, it's uh, there's sort of that. Um, well, this is definitely right. I mean, the thing is that well, and there is sort of a, the metaphorical thing near the end, which. Um, the, there's the thing near the end, which is a little bit, you know, which could be read as a rape metaphor. Um, but you know that bad things are going to happen to children in this book. And they do happen on screen. Um, and yeah, it's there's there's a sort of an element where it's like this is you could like if you read some fetish pornography and then tried to make it like realistic. A lot of this you could get this book out of it. Um there's a lot of like sort of weird, uncomfortable fetishy stuff in here, uh, and uh, it's like, what if you took sort of cartoon sexual sadists and made them into the masters of the universe kind of deal? Um, and so that's that's a lot to deal with. Although maybe that falls under content warnings more than anything else. Yeah, it could go either way. Um, mm -hmm. So I mean, I th I think it falls more under content warnings in the sense that I think that it is well handled by and large in this book. I mean, there's some parts where it's weird. But most of the time, it seems to be doing a thing that isn't just about, you know, fetish content. Um, yeah, no, I don't. I don't think that the it doesn't feel like the author is, is getting off on it. Um, that's not what I mean to imply. Yeah. It's, uh, it's just that you know, it's uh, it, it probably and again, this is this is more like unfortunate for us rather than unfortunate for this book. Like, I don't think you get away with this now. <laughs> yeah, it's no, it's it's true. This is, I mean, well, this book is also a good example of why small presses are important. Um, yes, because I, I think completely. even back when this book came out, I'm not sure you could have gotten away with it out of a major press. Maybe you could have, but certainly, you certainly couldn't now, and you probably yeah, still no. could out of a small press. Um, and one of one of the major plot points of this book is like a 13 year old having a crush on an adult. And uh, the sort and, of the weird way that that is navigated. And like, I don't think most people would want to touch that. Right. And particularly like the adult being aware of it and uh, using it to manipulate. Using it to manipulate the kid. Yeah. Right. Um, but the book doesn't think this is a good thing, obviously. Right. <laughs> yeah. But still, the adult who does that is a sympathetic viewpoint character. So you're right. This book, yeah. this book has some stuff that I'm not sure could fly as easily today, which again, shout out to small presses there important and doing God's work. Correct. Um, so that being said, let's uh, trundle right on into the, uh, into the content warnings. Um, oh God. So we've, <laughs> we've there's got, a lot. <laughs> uh, we've got mind control. We've got evisceration. We've got, um, you know, we've got self mutal harm. Uh, we have yeah. suicide. We have 
a fair amount of rape that all happens off screen, but they're quite um, matter of fact about. Um, we have losing your children. Yeah, and some some body like body horror, personal, you know, uh, like personal bodily, like you know, violation that is comparable. Yes, yes, um, and just some other like weird body horror elements. Um, yeah. <laughs> You know, there's there's the, a ton the, the of violence. The torture and sexual humiliation of children. Yep, yep. Um, and a ton of violence. And a ton of violence. And I think that this would probably actually be a fairly difficult book to read if you are a parent as well. Yeah. Um, well, maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I don't uh, know. Yeah. Um, I think that this book does a really... I mean, we, of course, are the, you know, the mom police on this podcast. <laughs> but I think this book does a really good job of making both the daughter and the mom equally like sympathetic and understandable in their motivations. Right. Um, she's also not a bad mom, which has, which is helpful. Yes. But you know, she's not a perfect mom either. Um, yes. She's not like a weirdly, none, right. I'm aware. But she's not yeah. like, but she's not like a weirdly idealized mom. You get, to, you can see all the various mistakes that she's making and, you know, and even the choices that she's making that are justifiable, there's a pretty good case to be made that that's still the wrong choice. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, you know, it's one of those things. I mean, really, one of the major discussions this book brings up is like, how do you bring up children under like impossible circumstances? Like, how do you introduce them to the to the ways in which the world is unfair? Like even in a world without um, like, you know, horrible vulture demons running it, there is I mean, it's a pretty one to one metaphor in this book about the way that young lives are consumed and used up. And like, how do you prepare your kids for that? Yeah. So, um, oh, also, and, no reproductive oh, autonomy whatsoever. <laughs> oh, okay. oh no, 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 no! This is one of those. Uh, this is one of those breeding program dystopias. Um. So, uh, that being said, let's uh, get into it and discuss it. Yeah. Spoiler zone. So. I really loved this book um, and, and I wasn't really expecting to mm -hmm. because it does start so strangely. And I was, because it starts in South Africa, I was like, okay, this, there's some like weird colonial stuff going on here. Um, yeah. And sort of the image of the, of the black general who is the first to sort of surrender and co-opt himself to the, uh, to the vulture people. Right, and the white um, chief of police who, you know, you're, who's the, your sympathetic viewpoint character for all of one chapter until he gets brutally eviscerated. Well, yes, but also, like, his horrible wife who sells her daughter to the, the vultures, although we don't yes. find that out until later. Um, uh, it sort of... It sort of comes back in the, like, in the, in the resistance agent who's undercover as a black stripper, or not undercover as black, but undercover as a stripper, <laughs> right. obviously. Um, I think that like, you know, there's, there's a number of things in this book that feel like very sort of unconsidered and libidinal, mm -hmm. um, not just in the sex way, but like, is sort of, these are anxieties that are being dredged up and sort of put forward, um, as is, mm -hmm. uh, and one of those anxieties is about sort of, you know, in a very real way, the return of colonial violence to the, the homeland. Um, huh, yeah. Uh, which I think is why it starts in South Africa. Um, and uh, the and I, one of my favorite things about it is like, okay, um, because the the vultures themselves don't do any of the like, you know, um, any of the any of the admin, as it were. Yes, and they're, also they're just... I, I sorry, I just want to interject, lest you think that we are overreading with this idea of colonial violence, the vultures have named themselves the over, specifically as a reference to the Ubermensch. So Yeah, they're they're Nietzsche fans. <laughs> right. Like they are textually Nietzsche fans. <laughs> um... yes. And it's implied that they are some sort of like there's some sort of parasite, like they need humans to to actually grow out of or something. Yeah. And, you know, it's it's sort of it's not clear what they actually are, but that's not important besides the the element of bird phobia uh, involved. <laughs> but it does it does it does provide some good creepy. Uh, the fact that she's that she doesn't get into details about it ends up making it, them work better as villains because you're like, especially, you know, the first time you see them. Their wings look stitched on, which is a nice little visual detail I didn't catch the first time I read it. 
Yeah, no, I, that really stuck with me um, because they have arms and also wings, and there's yes. some. Well, they they have wings. Turn. They have wings, but they have hands at like the bendy part of the wings. They don't right, have like exactly. arms. They have hands on their wings. Um, it's 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 gloriously dis distressing. Um, yes, I, th I feel like they they are built. They are based on some South African uh, 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 legend, although I didn't actually look that up to see if it was true. No, me neither. Um, I should have. Um, yeah, well, I'll put a jingle in here after. Okay. I'll, I'll, I'll figure it out <laughs> and then come back. Indeed it is the Izulu, also known as the Impundulu or Thequane, or the Lightning Bird, or the Hammercop is what the real bird some people think it's based on. And the Hammercop, if you know German, means hammerhead. And it's one of my favorite weirdly shaped birds. So that was a nice surprise. And it is not at all like a vulture. But yeah, the wonderfully creepy villains, um, sort of uh, the idea being that they're sort of this, like, you know, they, they rise back out of the earth like cicadas. Like it's this whole, like something that was deeply implanted is now coming home to roost kind mm -hmm. of thing. Um, and it, back when this book was written in what, like 2016 or so? I think it's, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I think it's 2016. Yeah, you could still definitely, it was, you were definitely starting to feel this, like, this resurgence of fascism and this resurgence of totalitarianism, like, coming back toward, like, you know, Western Europe via, you know, the sort of hinterlands. Like, just rising um, out of the ground. <laughs> exactly. And I, th I think it's, I think it's a pretty straightforward metaphor. Um, yeah. And, uh, and if, in case you hadn't noticed, because it also, you know, it, they make, like, references to various, uh, like, at one point, um, our hero, or one of our heroes, I actually can't remember which one of our heroes it is, like, ref refers to a science fiction short story about, like, sheep aliens who rise up and are slaughtered, which I think I've read, and I think it's a Philip K. Dick story. Um, think I was thinking of Beyond Lies the Wub, which is a very memorable short story, but not the one they're describing. If anyone knows what the real one is, please write in and let us know. Huh. The Yeah. Yeah. You're right. No, uh, I, it's weird that I can't remember who it was. I mean, it feels like well, I think it, I think it was it was I think it was o, uh, Omalis. Um I mean, probably who, it was yeah. Or her girlfriend. Um and speaking of Omalis, uh, in case you're not, you know, clear on <laughs> how we're sacrificing our children to keep <laughs> right. things going here. Right. The the collaborator is named very something very similar to Omalas. Right. <laughs> um, which by that point was kind of a current Tumblr meme in addition to being a classic Ursula Le Guin short story about the city, the paradise city that uh, is uh, run by, you know, torturing a single child somewhere in a basement. Um <laughs> Except this one, it's more than a single child. <laughs> this one, it's like yeah, all the children. Well, it's all it's all the non-privileged children. It's like right. Um, I, one of my favorite things about it that they go over like okay, who gets sent to the camps? And just in, and for the benefit of the listener, the uh, the camps are where you're sent to be determined whether you're going to be a breeder, a feeder, or a seed. A, um, a breeder is obvious. A feeder is just they eat you. And a yeah, seed, they, they grind you up. and a seed, which is not established until pretty close to the end, um, is when they use you as the host for, you know, tr being transformed into a new ver uh, vulture alien thing. Yeah, vulture demon. And it's, impl it's implied that like the most talented of the undesirables are the ones who get that. Um, right, but but you know, and uh, some of the kids, there's like, and about a quarter of the kids do come home from the summer camp. Like Jordan's dad is a summer camp uh, graduate. Yes, which I think is like it makes sense uh, to in that way because we're we are really paying a lot of attention to the way that adults handle this situation, mm -hmm. and like various different adults handle the 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 situation, like. One of my favorite characters, even though we don't see him very much, is like the absolutely doomed school counselor who like <laughs> is yes. having to, you know, be wise and mature and counsel the children about, you know, how, you know, they need to take the correct attitude into the slaughterhouse. Well, because um, I mean, and it's partly, you know, 
he's a good example of all these people who are trying to do their best under these impossible circumstances. Because what he's really trying to do is convince the kids to be, to be, you know, excel enough that they don't get sent to the slaughterhouse. But of course, that's impossible. And since it's, right. and since it's percentage based, if all of his school, if all of his counselees succeed, which they're not going to, I mean, Jordan and both of her siblings all get shipped off to the camps at once. Um, you know, that just means that somebody else's kids are. Right. Um, but the, uh, they're sort of, there are all the, the publicly available statistics are like, you know, the, it's basically sort of college admissions. Um, that's the metaphor. Again. Right. <laughs> um, you know, like you, it's the kids who would be going to good schools who generally don't get sent to the camps. And like, I think that it's heavily implied that, um, well, it's, it's stated that, you know, the camps weren't the vultures idea. The camps was right. the idea of the U S government who, when faced with, we have to get a certain number of your children were like, okay, how would the U S government, you know, implement a program to cull or sacrifice or, you know, put into the, into the baby farms, like X number of kids. And I feel like this book hits the nail absolutely on the fucking head. This is like exactly how the U S government would do it. Yes. Though it's, uh, it's worth noting, you get the sense also of things getting worse. And part of the thing about things getting worse is that even the privileged kids become less immune. Um, and this yeah, sort of works again, as a the, the, climate change or the a gradual COVID return thing. to violence, right? Yeah. And you know, and so like Jordan and her siblings were all born before, you know, a couple, a year or two after Jordan is born, they implement this is great. It's the one child policy, um, but unlike China's, where you're only allowed to have one child, it is uh, you're allowed to retain one. No, child. no, it's it's um, one one of your children must be marked as you know must be given right, to the birds right 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 and right, right, right. you know because presumably because they're not meeting their child quota or whatever they want more variety in their kids we don't know but we know that now right. there's a one child policy where everybody you know so you're it's basically your first child and so everybody's taking fertility drugs so that they can have like triplets so that you know they even if they only get to have kids once they can at least retain one um Right. It's it's again like, you know, the, the these subtle cultural shifts like, you know, as you know, back in the day when, you know, you had when you're the farmer had as many kids as they possibly could because they knew X numbers of them would die. Um, and, you know, as civilization progresses, you know, <laughs> that that's a terrible way to phrase it. But like, you know, as cost as the standard of living uh, gets better, birth rate goes down, as we know. And now as you know, the standard of the uh, the vultures uh, yes, close as, in as child. It's generally as child mortality goes down, so does the birth rate, and as child mortality goes up, because you know, right? It one 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 child because I think it's actually one child out of every birth. Um, right, right, right. And so now suddenly people are trying to have triplets, twins, and triplets, and not taking fertility drugs so that they can like keep a child. And it's, you know, it's the classic, like, you know, boomer thing where her dad went through the system when it wasn't quite as awful. Right. And so he's like, you know, okay, this is going to be hard, but we can be strong about it and we can get through it, you know, um, not realizing just what an absolute sort of charnel house it's become right. over the last like 20 or 30 years. Yeah. And her mother, who did not go through, who was more privileged and did not go through it, but who does, who's, you know, a um, OBGYN and works with, you know, and sees what's happening to the babies. She's the one who, even though she doesn't actually know what it's like, has a much clearer idea of how brutal this is going to be and the chances of her getting back any of her children ever. Well, she she develops that, right? right. Because, like, she's she's fooling herself to begin with. You're right. She's She thinks she, thinks she can, like, piano lessons and school counsel all of her kids Except maybe Jordan. There's this there's this interesting thing near the beginning where it's like, well, everybody has kind of written off Jordan. Like her mother's still trying to get Jordan to to you know do the things that might keep her out of the camps, but like everybody has written her off, and thus Jordan is like, why am I even trying? Right, exactly. Jordan's been sent to the special class, um, literally. Yeah. Uh, and you know you don't get out of the special class once they put you in the special class. Right. Um, God, I, I, her, the all the Jordan POV stuff about, you know, what basically what it's like being in public school, you know, uh, 
vultures or no vultures. Right. <laughs> it all feels very familiar to me, you know. Right. Well, and it's, you know, it's public school. It, it, what would we do if we were ruled by horrible vulture demons, um, but our governments were left largely intact? Well, public school would still be kind of the same, except the right. dread, except that the dread quotient is upped even further. Um and, you know, the writing off of the disabled uh, and, uh, you know, and or underachieving kids is just going to be much more complete. Um, exactly. Like, it's just, you know, it's the same basic idea, but the the avenues of escape are much fewer. Uh, right. If, you know, and like the consequences of falling out of the mainstream are, you know, significantly worse. Uh, although, you know, maybe not for every person, you know. Um, cause you know, the other thing about this book is like, we tend to not look at what happens to a lot of kids who drop out or fall out or are, you know, or are sort of turned into grist, um, yeah. by our education system and by our government. I, I mean, probably most of them aren't being sent to dystopian summer camp. Probably some of them are. I mean, those outward bound type thing, the like reform summer camps that, you know, periodically get shut down for killing the children. Um, and, yeah. um, no, I mean that it, it happens. It does. All the, and like, actually like the whole, like get out of your cabins in the morning and, and gather up around the flagpole. Uh, we did that when like outdoor school, um, in Oregon, uh, you, every, the middle schoolers all get sent out to like live in cabins for a month, um, and experience the outdoors. I think just as a, in an attempt to remove, to give everybody a break from concentrated having middle schoolers around, uh, -huh. uh, but, you know, the whole I felt like the author may have been through that because there were a lot of like things about the camp that felt like drawn from a very familiar experience for me mm. <laughs> from having, you know, having been there, like both in terms of like the sort of the peril, the the weird sort of, you know, we're we're doing activities that don't seem to mean anything and nobody seems to remember why we're doing anything, <laughs> The you know, the 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 top down authoritarianness of it and the, and of course the sing-alongs, but, <laughs> um, but uh, uh, my outdoor school experience wasn't that negative, but it was, it was certainly, no, it, I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't at any point uh, by made to strip in front of the, okay. uh, in front of the authority figures or eaten by vultures. But oh. um, <laughs> there were, however, a couple of, <laughs> it was, uh, I, I may edit this out, but I don't think I will. I, this is just a, 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 a uh, the uh, counselors. Um, it's like you, how it worked was that you got a couple of high schoolers who were in charge of every like cabin of middle schoolers. Uh -huh. And we had two of the nerdiest, weediest high schoolers who, and every, and all the high school like counselors could pick their own names who were calling themselves Bo and Shire. <laughs> um, and the, and my cabin was full of like, you know, middle schoolers from the difficult middle school uh, up up north. And so there were up, like 50% of the kids were bigger and like looked older than the counselors in the, it was, it was, uh, it was a difficult situation for poor Bo and poor Shire. But Aww. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. They volunteered. They kind of deserved it. Uh, that that is that memory is. <laughs> um, incidentally, it's actually it's not Heaven who uh, tells the story. I was looking it up. Um, it's Taylor, which makes a lot of uh, sense. Right, right. Remind me who Taylor is. Taylor's the lesbian, the other lesbian teen at the camp. Oh, the right. One with the yes, razor blade. Course. One with the razor blade. Oh my god, that razor blade scene. Um, I'm afraid that there's something wrong with my brain because the scene where a teenage girl produces the razor blade that she's had hidden in her vagina made me think of professional wrestling. Because you see, in professional wrestling, you have to sometimes uh, hide a razor blade about your person so you can bleed at the appropriate dramatic moment. And that is a place to hide it that I have not come across. Uh, you, she, that that's like, you know, that is as, as is drawn from life as anything. Like, if you know anybody who's been uh, through involuntary incarceration as a teenager, which I have, which I do, um, you know, you you sneak in what you can through whatever means necessary. Right. Well, it's also uh, she's very, you know, she's sneaking in the razor blade very specifically to kill herself when because 
she has a functioning uterus be uh, because unlike many of the other kids, her parents didn't do anything to disqualify for her from the breed program, which incidentally is a is an interesting choice, right? That these parents have decided that, you know, they would rather their children be eaten by vultures than be victims of sexual violence. It is. That is extremely interesting. Um, and it's like, I feel like the, the kids in the breed program might, might, you know, be having a better life than the, the people who go the other two ways. Um, well, they have lives for a I start. Mean, that's the and, thing. And some of them survive it. <laughs> um, right. I mean, on the other hand, it's miserable. And like Taylor, you know, Taylor does choose to commit suicide rather than uh, go into this program. Um, and, you know, and that is that is framed as a reasonable choice. But parents, but, you know, that's her choice. When the parents right. are, you know, giving you a hysterectomy when you're like eight, that's taking the choice away from you. Indeed, you could, you know, <laughs> uh, doing uh, irreparable damage to our to our daughters. Um, sorry, that's a that's a turf talking. <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, yeah, no, I think that that's a. I think that that's a cynical but accurate viewpoint about like people's attitudes toward their daughter's sexuality. Yeah, I think like, so. And their sons, honestly. Um, but it is an interesting choice um, that uh, they, because you don't hear about them doing that to their sons to keep their sons out of the breed program because, you know, the idea that their sons are forced to have sex with young women is not, I think, by most, I think most of these parents aren't thinking about that as sexual violence in the same way. So, you know, if they're... Yes, although the book... The book, the book does. does. The book does, like yes. They, it, it definitely says, like, the the boys are, are not having a good time with this. Right, it, it <laughs> talks know? about, you know, the, the red-faced, sobbing girls and how most of the boys are also red-faced and sobbing. Um, right. Ugh. Man, it's a it's a really nasty, cynical book, and I think very accurate <laughs> um, in a lot of ways. Yes. So there's a I think that you know there's a lot of interesting choices that people make in this book. Um, you know what there's because I was just talking about uh, the taking the you know your choices away from their daughters, but there's also you know obviously Jordan gets to choose you know first June gets to choose to sacrifice herself or to take her to remove herself from her family uh, to spare one of her children. Um, right. And in fact, all of the parents who are presented with that choice, it's very Sophie's choice, except that basically every parent in this book who's presented with that choice waves it. And it's mentioned that this always happens is that, you know, if you have, if you have triplets and one of them has to be signed up um, to, you know, be given over to the birds, parents almost always wave that and make the liaison choose instead. That makes a perfect sense. It does. Um, but then Jordan is given that same choice of, you know, heaven, when heaven is telling her, you don't, you know, you don't have to do this. You don't, you do not have to take this virus and sign up to be um, transformed into a bird demon and thus, and, you know, and through that process end up, you know, spreading this uh, genetically engineered virus and killing all the bird demons. You could just go home. And not only does she choose not to go home, she gets to choose which of her brothers to save. And she doesn't waive the choice. Yeah. Uh, and I think that, like, I think that one of the things that, like, um, makes her a hero and, like, makes Jordan the hero of this book is that, you know, she is at every turn unwilling to turn her head away. Yeah. You know? Um, I mean, it's not as though that she has been given given much of an opportunity to do so, but like the thing that really makes her able to face down the or and able to deliver the the sort of virus to the bird people is that she will not allow herself to rationalize away anything that's happening to her. Right. You know, and you know, and um, it's clear that this has been going on since she was a child. I mean, she's very clear that you know she was acting out and she got meds. But by the time she got meds, it was too late for her. Um, and the fact that, you know, she was diagnosed with behavioral problems and medicated for them 
too late to save her. And by the time she's like eight, she knows that she's slated for death, specifically because she didn't get her diagnosis early enough. Um, I mean, God, it's 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 really right. It's <laughs> really like, you know, it's it's really it feels yeah. very real. It feels exactly how, you know, of course, that's how we would treat kids if we were under the horrible overlordship of vulture demons because that's kind of how we treat our kids now (laughs) there you go (laughs) um yeah no i think like and sort of the major character arc of jordan's mom um june i think Uh yeah over the course of the book is like her her, like june's narrative voice and jordan's narrative voice start out like very distinct right because jordan is i think like a, a really wonderfully realized ninth grader yeah who is obsessing about people's appearance and sexuality while at the same time being like, you know, angry at everything. Right. Um, and her mom is being a mom, you know, and like a long, long suffering mom who is, you know, fighting to keep under control while, you know, her job forces her to do these awful things. But like by the end of the book, when June has really seen that all of the illusion of choice that she had was an illusion and that all of the stuff that she had been doing didn't matter. Yeah. Um, she starts to sound a lot like her daughter, you know? Right. Um, like that sort of, like where, where Jordan got it, that sort of defiance, you know, it's like, you know, June just keeps coming back to, we will not let this happen. You know, I will not let this happen. I'm not going to comply anymore. Right. And so, and even, even though like she ends up just, you know, emotionally destroying her husband, um, that's a choice she's willing to make because, and just, right. Because he's not willing to make that choice. Right. Exactly. You know, it's like at the end of the day, she looks at him and is like, I can't follow you here because you're not willing to see what's happening around. Right. You, exactly. You know? uh, um, and I, I thought that was like, this is the best case scenario. You know, the, like the, 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 the the P flag mom, you know, right, <laughs> you know, reaching the the youth like reaching back and being like, no, this is what's happening to me, and the parents like hearing and believing them and right. being in that way. Well, you know, you know, because that's also you get two kinds of parents when you know when your kid gets diagnosed with something like autism, and one is the you know classic autism speaks mom, but the other is the parent who's like, no, I'm going to be. I'm going to get really loud about accommodations and things like that. And, you know, neurodiversity and. And we should, we should mention that the neurodivergence that uh, Jordan is diagnosed with is oppositional defiant disorder, which is not real. Uh, Right. But it's a real diagnosis. (laughs) And it basically means this kid is difficult. Um, (laughs) But I mean, but that's also, I mean, it seems like a dystopian thing for a kid to get diagnosed with, but that's but it is a, a real actually thing. a thing in the real world that pe- that people do to silo these kids who maybe have a reason to not want to comply. You know, right? Well, and specifically with or, or not. Well, and but, I mean, the know. thing is that specifically with Jordan is that once she gets her meds, it's not like everything is great, but she's able to. You know, once she gets her meds, most of her outbursts become controlled outbursts that she's opted. That you know, she's doing. Because she rightly identifies what is going on as horrible bullshit. Um, and when she does... Yeah, and it's, so, it's kind of exactly the way that my meds work. <laughs> right. <laughs> but, you know, the thing is that... Or, you know, ADHD meds. Um, and mm-hmm. when she... And, you know, the first thing they do at the camp is take away her meds. And one of the things that her liaison does for her that makes heaven slightly, you know, that makes that sort of helps justify her crush on heaven beyond just that heaven is really pretty um Mm -hmm. and honest with her is that she brings her back her meds and that's also when she's able to because you know the entire strategy this is one of the things in the book that works better on a metaphorical level than on an actual you thought this through level is that the resistance's entire strategy depends on a teenage girl with behavioral problems managing to hit the perfect sweet spot of just defiant enough to you know have leadership qualities but not so defiant that um you know she's just gonna get mulched um and but you know the way that she's able to do this is because she has access to her meds her task is to determine the exact angle at which one should lean in 
too far And you're difficult to work with Too little and you're not seen I suspect it's approximately 30 degrees Right, she is She is able to be controlled enough And yeah, it's like Even even without the, the sort of the the hypnotism thing which um the heather has been sort of heaven radicalized heaven sorry yes heaven <laughs> has been radicalized by her girlfriend um the the stripper the stripper uh, slash, slash resistance agent resistance agent yes who is uh who is undercover as a stripper essentially um uh, and then because she can't hide her thoughts from the vultures has volunteered to like you know, go under this sort of um, hypnosis, which she, uh, like, like living this double life grinds her down, destroys her, like, on a regular basis, and then they have to, like, restart the whole cycle again, which is, like, it's it's a little bit of a, this one is a weirder metaphor right. and one that doesn't work yeah. quite as much, but it is it is absolutely a metaphor for double consciousness. Um, yeah. Well, it's, you know, for serving two masters. Right. And I mean, it, does, it is definitely a thing that works slightly better on the metaphorical level. I mean, it does also, it is also a pretty good little science fictional bit of when you are under the control of telepathic bird aliens, how on earth do you have a mole? And obviously through yeah. hypnosis. <laughs> <laughs> indeed. Indeed, indeed. Um, I, uh, I think that, like, uh, our, I would have... You know, in a book full of really well-developed characters, I would have liked a little bit more development and a little bit more history of said black stripper yeah, girlfriend. Yeah, Marla. Because her being the black stripper girlfriend sort of overwhelms everything else. I mean, she does um, also get to be the badass resistance agent um, who keeps like does, sne- yes. who keeps sneaking into the horrible summer camp. Um, and and I actually wonder because you know, realistically, you would not want to make this um, you would not want to make this a multiple visit kind of thing. Uh, because every time you have to sneak in, you're risking yourself again. So I do wonder if part of the reason they do that is to give her more opportunities to not just be the black stripper girlfriend. Yeah, I would, I would, I probably, I agree with that. And there's also just like, she does get a few good character touches. Like, you know, um, I love how, like, even though she knows what's going on, she can't help but be like completely exasperated by heaven. Um, right. You know, <laughs> Uh, right. you know, it's like this, this thing is really d- destroying their relationship and it sort of has to be that way. You know? Right. And, and, and still, you know, even if like you understand that part of the reason why your girlfriend is in a depressive spiral over being a collaborator with the horrible regime is, you know, that you have her hypnotized so that she could be an, un, you know, a consensual, but unwitting mole. Um, that doesn't mean it's any less frustrating when she's doing, when she hates herself so much that she's also self-sabotaging your relationship, especially when you have to keep that relationship going because otherwise she will not be an effective mole. Um, so I, I wish we could have gotten at least one scene from Marla's perspective. I think it would, it, it would be, it would have to come at the end because until then it's. Yeah. Otherwise it gives away the game, but. Um, I do, I do like, I mean, and sort of one little detail that sort of underpins that is that when she gets into, you know, when they've put like, uh, when they've put Jordan, you know, in the punishment area and she's like been beaten to shit and is being prevented and starved and being prevented from, you know, sleeping like the, you know, even though Marla's like the resistance fighter who like is keyed into what is going on and is like working, she still she doesn't actually understand the full extent of the horror. Right. And which is, I think part of what allows her to keep going because like, right. Cause heaven has to absorb that. Right. Heaven you know, sees all her. of this. And this is probably the first time that, you know, Marla has actually been up close with these summer camps is this particular operation. Right. And you know, you see that in her like genuine shock, um, on seeing the state that Jordan is in, you know, which doesn't pre- prevent her from turning Jordan into a suicide bomb. Right. But, you know, but you know, at still, least they, like, at least they're telling Jordan exactly, you know, like <laughs> it, it's, it's really, you know, they make some really interesting choices on this mission. And again, mission works a little bit better metaphorically than at good solid mission planning, where you'd think you just inject a bunch of these kids with the virus and assume that some of them are making it to the seed program. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, but it it suffers from the you know the problem of like writing a book about revolution where it's like okay, how do we do it? Um, we're gonna genocide them, right? <laughs> you know, it's just like, huh? I don't know. I mean, if we're if we're if we're viewing the metaphors like these are the elites and the rich of the world, you know, I don't know how you do that, you know. Yeah, um, well, and you know, um it's the part that works the least good, but I guess you know they need to be able to accomplish something or else it would be just in- or, entirely bleak. Right. You know? uh, or else there's, there's no there's no novel here if it's just horrible things happen and then this girl dies. Horribly. Right, exactly. Um, so, you have to you give know, her they, some agency, and unfortunately, you know, the agency she gets is being a suicide bomb, which for a ninth grader is not a lot of agency, but is, you know, she's getting to make meaningful choices. Um, and the fact that, and you know, you can almost read the fact that they keep asking her, you know, are, are you in? Are you sure you want to do this? You know, Marla asks her twice, uh, gives her, is like, well, I'm going to give you a week to think about it just in case. Um, and then heaven comes back and heaven's like, I could just take you home now. Um, yeah. And you know, that part of that obviously is to heighten her, you know, Jordan's agency and the fact that she's making this decision, but it's also kind of the adults who are failing her on every level and turning her into a suicide bomb, trying to make themselves feel better about it. I I agree. I agree. Like this is like the more you, th- the more you turn this book over and you're, your head or at least me like the happier i am with it. i think it really yeah it's really like comprehensively you know interesting can i actually can i talk to a couple of little uh, yeah, sure. uh things that i liked little things i liked they're like i said the 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 a lot of attention is paid to the character voices one a, a really deft touch is that we're given to understand that marla has a southern accent and when heaven is under hypnosis she says she might be a mite older where it's like she takes on Marla's voice when yes! she's under Marla's hypnosis. It's like that's that's a beautiful little touch. That's a that's a right a reet touch <laughs> as the as the Brits would say. Um I I love the use of therapy and therapy language being used to pacify people dealing with impossible situations. That's a mm-hmm. you know, again something that the Sand of Bright Doors um used. Yeah. Uh and um like <laughs> the counselor who thinks that they can have a moral victory over the bird people by behaving well as they're led to right. the, <laughs> led to the slaughter is very familiar for students of history, right? Um, among other yes. things, um, you know, I naming no, no names, <laughs> and uh, then um, and they're like little touches, like you know, when they're when they're talking, when Heather's come out of her. Her heaven. hypnosis, you know, because <laughs> heaven. Sorry, I don't know why I keep doing that because heaven's a stupid name, as right? Well. But it's and heaven omelas. Heaven omelas is the most heavy-handed name that you could possibly right. give in this But you know, like that's um, that's where the all good children come from. So of the title, so yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, but when when heaven is out of it and she's like, and it, she's reflecting, like you know, if the collaborators were capable of suicide, there wouldn't be any of them. Then she corrects herself and is like, no, there would be fewer of right. them. Right. Um, it's like, yeah, no, you get it. <laughs> right. And of course she's reflecting on this because she is regretting her inability to commit any for- serious form of self-harm. Um, it is yeah. interesting that her conditioning basically, you know, denies her any form of physical self-harm does not deny her alcoholism. You know, even like she will be punished for drinking. They could condition her out of drinking, but they choose not to so that they are giving her the option of self-destructing in a way that they can punish her for without losing her. Um, yes. And similarly, there's no conditioning about self-destructing your emotional life because why would there be? You're not going to die. You're not going to kill yourself. So <laughs> Indeed. also, you know, the bird demons don't really care about your emotional life. <laughs> well, they, they kind of do. They're they're It's, it's said that they're like actively sadistic, which is an interesting sort of, you know, um, it's an interesting like twist on the overlords, the fascist overlords. It's like, because I think that there is actually a certain truth to that is that, yeah, you know, when you think about, you know, the, the history of genocide and oppression that we know, in the there's last a lot of years, active like, sadism. Generally, when you see, yeah. when you see any, like when you see any form of mass or institutionalized violence, um, whether that's genocide or, you know, um, 
the old mental health institutions, the old psychiatric institutions, you see a lot of sadism. Yeah, the cruelty is the point. Right. And um, as, as a means of social control. Right. Um, and similarly, like, there's the whole thing where, you know, they like to make bargains. I mean, that's what keeps heaven alive as her mother trades her. Um, yeah, and, when... and, you know, and that's what June does to, and you know, that's what June correctly infers from heaven's existence. Um, and, you know, and like the three facts about her life that she has let slip, um, you know, timeline wise. Um, and so then she's able to do the same thing. And it's very, it's clear that, like, the reason that they like to make deals is specifically because that's another way of exerting their power. Yeah, no, there's a lot, again, there's a lot that will be familiar to students of the Holocaust um, and, you know, similar events uh, that, you know, it is that feeling of, like, yeah, I'll spare your life, but I'll make you, you know, pay for it incredibly dearly, you know, is, there is a... It's part of that sort of that overall sense of like we have, you know, we control you to such an extent that we can choose to spare you for capricious reasons. Yeah. And we can take it back at any time. Yeah. And that's, you know, a way of increasing your sense of power over somebody. Um. Yeah. Segway. So what do you think about Jordan's choice of brothers to save? Uh... I mean, I mean, wouldn't you save the sensitive art, like artistic one, and not the asshole? Probably, but the thing is that the well, the thing is that there's two ways to go about it, right? Is do you save the one you think is most likely to survive, or the one that you like better? <laughs> I mean, I've always been entirely of the opinion that you save the one that you like better, um, because the people who I like better have always been the ones that are less likely to survive. Mm. Uh, yes, but you know, I think that that's very much. Um, that's very much the choice that the teenage sister is going to make and not the mom. Right? I mean, you've already sort yeah. of seen the parents have invested more effort in their two sons than their daughter because once their daughter gets put into the special ed track, it's kind of hopeless for her. Um, right. You know, they're focusing on the ones who have the best chance of surviving, even if, as it turns out, none of them do. Um and Jordan, partly, I think it's that Jeremy's more likable, but also she says that he's the one who's going to help da her dad survive the best on his own. Yeah, which, you know, is a, uh, I think that that's sort of like, it will help her dad survive because her dad, because he'll be the one that will need her dad. Right, um, exactly. Which, and that, that makes sense to me. Um, his dad being the farmer who you know takes care of the thing that's in front of him i think would might be lost without like a somebody to actually take care of yes with with two way. of his children dead and his wife um being you know serving as a the obgyn to the forced reproductive reproduction uh faction mm -hmm. <laughs> and like but part of the tension in the book is about you know, how even though the the parents are, you know, pouring efforts into their sons who they think might, you know, still survive it, like, the the love between uh, June and Jordan is so clear throughout. Like, yeah, just you know, the fact that, you know, she knows where Jordan goes to hide and has just pretended not to know because she feels like a teenage girl needs a place that's just hers to hide in. Right, exactly. And it's like the, and there, there is the sort of thing where it's like, um, you know, lost in all this entire, you know, in this like chaos of, you know, um, of, uh, uh, you know, external circumstances, like, there's absolutely sort of this, you know, almost Freudian thing going on where, you know, uh, Jordan is into older women because like, you know, and you don't want to say because, but like her relationship with her mom is weird. Right. Um, and it's like, there's this, all of this like love damned up that can't come out because of these circumstances and because of all the resentment and fear. Um, and uh, like, I think there's like some sort of very deft touches of like the feelings of, of like the tension and the physical intimacy between Jordan and June that speak to that. Yeah. Um, 
without like making it too overt. Um, and uh, yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, uh, and you know, the, the way that, I, well, as Tasha I thought was really good was the way that even when she's deeply exasperated with and also terrified for Jordan, June still occasionally has these flashes of like real fondness of, yep, that's my girl making horrible choices. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think she's proud yeah. at the end of the day. Well, certainly, you know, certainly is... at the very end of the day when, you know, she gets word that the vultures are going to start dying and it's, you know, because of Jordan. Right. But, he, but even before that, you know, and like uh, Jordan, what's, what's her, the, the other girl's name, her, her sort of, High school, her sort of camp fling, as it were. Taylor, Taylor, yeah. Yeah, it's like, you know, Taylor is like, you know, the thing that Taylor finds attractive about Jordan is her unwillingness to take any, to take it, you know, and I think that her mom is seeing the exact same thing in her. Right, I mean, on, on some level, it. that's also what the over find attractive about Jordan. Yes, right? so is the, leadership right, qualities. Right, like it's, it's leadership <laughs> qualities. Um, the fact that she's willing to stand up for others is, you know, that is that is the sort of thing of, and again, I think that that's a very good depiction of, you know, what you see when, you know, in this kind of power dynamic between the overlords and the oppressed is, you know, that this sort of admiration for the courage of people, even as they are murdering them. Well, there is that, but there's also like, if you want, a like a inventively nasty concentration camp guard take somebody who's been bullied their whole life right you know and give them a th give them a whip you know and like watch them excel uh you know unfortunately unfor or unfortunately that's just sort of how it goes and i think that there there's you know in another world which is not quite so you know brainwashy mm -hmm. uh that could have been what they were thinking you know in elevating her to this position mm -hmm. I'm not saying this would be me right now, but when I was 13 You probably shouldn't have given me the slightest scrap of authority Or a gun So, okay, one what? other thing I did want to talk about is the scene, because this is one of the ones that One of the parts that really stuck with me over, you know, since I read this book when it first came out um, Is the whole, the scene where, or the two scenes where Marla and Heaven, hypnotized Heaven, ascertained that, you know, Jordan is a good candidate for this, be partly because she can be manipulated because she has such a crush on Heaven. And then the mm -hmm. scene where Heaven specifically plays that up so that Jordan will attack her. Yeah, and it's it's like, you know, well, what do you do? Um, <laughs> where do you... Like, where is the sensitive spot on the oppositionally defiant teen? You know, you know, violence will not, will not, you know, make her do what you want because she knows how to deal with violence. Right, but any um, other kind of emotional reaction might get you violence. <laughs> right, exactly. It's but, you know, poker and something that she is like incredibly deeply embarrassed and in denial about, and uh, and she might just go off, and it's like. You know, it's, and Mar. I think that the thing that sticks with me about it is like, you know, when Heather is under Marla's hypnosis and she's like, can you make her attack her? And Heaven. Heather's like, yes, absolutely. And, and <laughs> God damn it. And uh, Heaven is like, you know, and Marla's like, can you make her attack you? And Heaven is like, yes, I can. And Marla's like, yeah, I know you can. I know that if, you know, I know you. <laughs> right. I know that if you <laughs> you have this capability in you of, you know, getting a rise out of manipulating people and getting a rise out of them. And like, yeah, yeah. I think it's just sort of a really straightforward observation of what you can do to get so far under a, a 13 year old skin that they'll lose control. It is, but it's also I, what I think what made me it stick with me and also what would make this a, you know, part of what would make this a book that would have a harder time these days is just like the cruelty of it. Here's this girl who they're, mm -hmm. here's this girl and they are, you know, these are ostensibly the good guys and they are the people that we are mostly rooting for. And part of their strategy involves playing on this girl's crush, not to like get her to do things for you because she has a crush, but specifically to make her feel betrayed and embarrassed so that she'll be violent, so that, you know, she'll be locked up. And like, 
to do this, and specifically for a lesbian to do this to a queer teenager. Um, you know, I know that this is what you were saying at the beginning about there's there's a different there's a different book that could have taken this plot beat and made it deeply fetishy. Yeah, I think that um, like from my perspective, I think that it's it's part of the sort of the clear eyed way that this is looking at revolution, right. because it's like if you if you look at the history of, you know, revolutionary movements, they don't tend to be nice. No, you know, they, they don't absolutely tend to don't act. In, I mean, the successful ones particularly do not act in a way that is any more moral than the people who are oppressing them. And in some cases, like, you know, um, in some cases worse. <laughs> In some cases worse. Like I was I was like, you know, reading about the process of, you know, uh of the uh uh um why why can't I think of the word? Um what would Zimbabwe used to be called? Um Rhodesia. Rhodesia, yeah. The Rhodesia the Rhodesian um um revolution and it's like yeah, and they're like, Yeah, you know, the the propaganda was largely accurate, <laughs> you know. <laughs> These the, the revolutionary militias were doing horrible, awful things, and so were the Rhodesians. And guess what happens when you're in a situation like this? Like, you know, there's there's n nobody is going to come out of this kind of situation morally unscathed. Right, know? but the thing is that... So I think the thing that I'm trying to get at is that in a lot of these books, um, what this would come out of, you know, the way that you would see that the, uh, you know, the, the revolutionary side are also you know, morally gray, is through violence. You would see them, you know, let civilians die, or you would see them, you know, kill people who begged for mercy or whatever. The fact that you're seeing them do something that's just like, even though it's for an end, is such a, like, small, petty, emotional cruelty, I think is a really good choice. Because when we read fiction, we're somewhat desensitized to, you know, fictional violence at this point. Of course, you know, the, re you know, like... It's all you can almost kind of root for the watching the revolutionaries kill, you know, the pleading rich, you know, but help like rich teenagers, like the rich helpless people. Um, but yeah. you can't. It's you can almost root. You for can it. almost root for it, but you can't necessarily. You know, you don't get that same like hell yeah feeling watching this woman manipulate a queer teenage girl. Yeah, you know, and like, um, that's the reason why I brought up, you know, uh, the the Rhodesian situation because, like, guess who? Guess I, both sides were using rape as a terroristic weapon, right? You know? And it's like that's you know that that'll bring you up short in a way that you know just killing you know killing some landlord uh, will not, right? Or you know. or you know some landlord's family um, if you really want to you know push the morally gray thing. Right. I mean, you know, there's the sexual element and also just in that way of it's one, you know, it's much easier to feel to be sympathetic towards violence than towards just being shitty toward, you know, to the main character. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, that's fiction. For right, it. exactly. <laughs> it really, it, it brings right. And so I thought I just I feel like that was a really good choice on the part of the author it conveys the moral ambiguity of the revolutionaries in a way that is weirdly more effective than showing them do something objectively more awful would be. You're absolutely right. You know, I, the more we talk about it, the more I'm like, damn, this is like one of the better books that we've covered, you know? And I think that the, one of the reasons why I'm why you know, that might surprise me slightly is just that um, it's, it, it it has you you really it you get you're jarred by it you know it's like particularly if you go in without any prep or with as, as I, I did, did the first time I read like, it oh. yeah and, and as you did yeah you're just like okay what kind of what kind of book is this right you know and it takes a really long time for that to sort out and into and like as such I like I was like how prurient is this gonna be you know how how like I'm really getting like big sort of you know as I keep saying like weird weird sex vibes, weird fetish vibes, like, you know, what's going on here? And then it's like, oh, no, it's actually trying, taking on, like, five different really difficult things at once and succeeding um, at the end of the day. So, goddamn, you know. Whenever we cover a book that features institutionally mandated sexual assault, like this or Baru Cormorant, 
I think about how much of it is prurient and how much of it is straight horror and how there can be two sides of the same coin. I think this book threads the needle admirably, but by definition, it'll be something that you have to decide for yourself. But I do wonder if somebody was looking at a hentai comic and thinking, how would this actually work in real life? Yeah, no, it's... um. I, this is a book that it really, for me, held up on the reread, um, mm. and partly, and again, and because the first time you read it, it's so. I think the Girls of Paper and Fire comparison is good. There's this dread hanging over everything, um, and yet when the thing happens, it's still really awful. Um, yeah. And like, and I, that's always I think pretty impressive to pull off, and rereading it. I knew exactly how it was going to end and that dread was still very much there, but I was, and in some ways it was worse because I could actually see all the, ver you know, all these decision points that are more obvious on the reread. So, right. Yeah, no, I think that this is for, for a book that looks initially like it's going to be a, you know, somewhat trashy dystopian YA, um, and has heavy, you know, some heavy handed things like heaven Omalas, um, the collaborator who sacrifices children, yeah. um, you know, it's, but it, it, it ends up actually being, a, I think quite a well-constructed and well-written piece. I agree. And like, you know, I love that our, our hero who we care about, the ninth grader, is like really unpleasant about her fat classmate. Right. You know? Yeah, no, she's that's, awful. That's being a ninth grader, you know. <laughs> I mean, yeah, and and that that very awfulness is part of what, you know, <laughs> makes her survive. Well, until um, it doesn't. <laughs> until it doesn't, yes. <laughs> survive long enough to be employed as a as a suicide right. weapon. But um, but in any case, uh, yeah, I think that I think yeah. that probably brings us to the end of yeah, our conversation. I think so. Um, anyway, I'm going to just end this on the note of this is why we need small presses. Uh, they're, uh, one of the major printer distributors for small for a lot of the really small presses in America just closed uh, unexpectedly mm. and incredibly sketchily in a way that's going to screw over a lot of the small presses. So, like, this is, again, my call to support our small presses because they are the ones who will take chances on weird, ambitious, interesting books like these. Couldn't have said it better myself. All right. Uh, all right. Uh, until, until next, next time. Until next time. I don't even know what we're doing next, but we'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs>